I growled at him once and said, stop being Batman. <laughs> Because he was true. trying to get a bit whispery at the very, <laughs> right at the very, very beginning. My first encounter with Salman, I, I mean, I think Salman pervades the culture. And so even the name Morpheus, the King of Dreams, had kind of haunted me in my youth. But I really didn't confront it as a piece of literature until I found out about this project. Ah, the audition casting process for Morpheus. Yours must have been a nightmare, mine was a nightmare, but we had two completely different nightmares. The first thing to say was a very long process. Yeah. It, it, it began in January, February 2020 and ended in August 2020, I think. For, 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 for me, for you, yeah. I'm sure it went on even longer. As is entirely necessary, because it's a character that is so utterly beloved um, by me more than anyone. And I think it requires you to spend time with a human being to discover whether they can live up to any small dream you have of who he is. The process of casting Morpheus didn't go anything like I thought it was going to go. Tom was in the first 10 auditions. You know, we got 10 auditions through from our uh, Lucinda Sison, our wonderful casting director, went off and said, here you go, here's your first 10. And we looked at those first 10 and we went, oh, it's Tom, that's great. What I figured would then happen was very, very rapidly over the next month, Tom would be on a list and we'd have another nine people on that list with Tom. And that list would go through to Warners and Netflix and then we'd, we'd all pick somebody off that list. I loved that Tom was there. Tom obviously was, you know, he was our candidate, but I, I thought it's not that quick. It's never that simple. And they're never in that first batch of people that you look at. I think I personally have now seen about 1500 Morpheus auditions. <laughs> I hesitate to imagine how many um, Lucinda Sison and her team must have watched before they ever came to me. We definitely got to the point of looking at maybe another 600 auditions and going, we still have a short list of Tom, when the pandemic hit. And as the pandemic hit, we actually basically did something that I'd never heard of a company doing before or since, which is Warner just decided to turn to Tom and say, we think it's you. We would just like to pay you to not go and get another job. <laughs> right now, just have faith in us. <laughs> Tom was sort of being paid to not go and get another job. Netflix basically went, well, the pandemic has given us extra time that we didn't know we had. Why not look at every other possible Morpheus from around the entire planet? So that was where we got to watch another thousand auditions. <laughs> but what was, what was actually great was having watched all of those, we were able to go to Netflix and say, it's Tom. We know it's Tom. Everybody here is completely happy with it being Tom. And by the way, it's Tom. And we could do that with passion and we could do that with certainty. At the point where we really had looked at over 1500 and we'd looked at them with, you know, always looking at them going, perhaps some Orpheus is here. And we also have Tom. <laughs> um, and we'd look at them and go, well, nope, we don't have a Morpheus yet, but we've got Tom. Um, that finally everybody came on board and saw what Alan Heinberg and David Goya and I had seen in that Many first <laughs> in the first thing. And we got them all to see it. And then what I love best about that audition process, the casting process, very soon the entire world gets to see it. Tonight we will achieve what no one has even attempted. We will summon and imprison death. I give you a coin made from a stone. And I give you a feather pulled from an angel's wing. And I give you the blood from my vein. We summon you together. I didn't think he is a god. I, I, I remember Neil said something once where to, to have a god, people have to believe in it. Yeah. Mm. And Morpheus exists whether you believe in him or not, because he is endless. I mean, this is the being that 
creates our dreams and our nightmares and our fears and our fantasies and therefore is bearing one of the great responsibilities in existence. He is unimaginably powerful. He controls your dreams. He controls your nightmares. He is ruler of the worlds that you go to when you close your eyes and you go somewhere else. He is prince of stories, in charge of our, our, our stories, and he's terrible at relationships. You know, he has all of that stuff going for him, and then he is a walking car crash when it comes to trying to deal with people. Which is why they were like, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the extraordinary thing about the imprisonment is I think it, it, it's the first time um, in his existence in which his power is taken away from him and his tools of office are stolen from him. That elicits, a, kind of engenders a certain mortality within him and starts to bring him down, not to a level of humanity exactly, but, he's, but he begins to, to exist on Earth as humans, as vulnerable as humans exist. And more specifically, once he escapes, he needs their help. He needs the help of Joanna, he needs the help of Matthew, who is the soul of a human, he needs even the help of John Dee. And I think that it's the first time that he has, has needed that and has therefore seen the world through the eyes of people, which one could argue is the birth of empathy. Morpheus's imprisonment is what begins the story. But it doesn't begin the story as an event. You know, he could have been imprisoned at any other time. But it's who he becomes through that time, what he loses, and how that imprisonment and the results of it change him. That really is the big story of Sandman. That's the story that we're going to be experiencing in, in this season and in future seasons and through the whole Sandman arc is this is the point where he begins to change and how much he can change and who he is and who he's going to become. That all starts with him being taken prisoner, unawares and imprisoned for over a hundred years in the undercroft of Thorny Rig. Death has family. Desire, destiny, despair. Which one have I got? Dream. I mean, it was definitely a, a baptism of fire to <laughs> be introduced to the people you're going to be spending nine months with, naked, climbing into a glass sphere, which, because of the way that it was built, couldn't be broken apart easily. And so I genuinely would sit in it for hours at a time, which was very COVID safe. Uh, but um, slightly dispiriting. But I think uh, actually it, it was a beautiful way to begin because in that silence, you can over, only ever really believe yourself to be a character or think carefully about it when you're living it. You know, you can do all the work beforehand, but until you're exposed uh, in front of an audience or a camera, you're never really, you never really know where you are. And to have the opportunity to be living that in silence and to really meditate upon it and to think carefully about it was an extraordinary blessing. And then on a very specific level, I cared very much about the physicality and the image of Morpheus. We all, as fans of Sandman, have seen those pictures and we know about his kind of skeletal, muscular, kind of uh, otherworldly, inhuman, physique and something that's very exciting about physical aspect of things is you can solve that problem. I can go to myself, I can make my body look like that. It requires A, B, C and D in a way that I can't go, how do I get into the soul of an endless? Like, and so there was something quite satisfying about beginning with a task that was achievable. And I worked hard to, to, to create this physicality that I felt was unusual. I growled at him once and said, <laughs> stop being Batman. <laughs> Because he was true. trying to get a bit whispery at the very, right at the very, very beginning. So it was my first day. It was. It was literally. It, it was literally first, the first day. <laughs> and I'm like, like, thanks, boss. <laughs> it was. It was my one. It was. It was, it was, it was, it was incredibly note. helpful. Um, I became Robin after that. <laughs> um, I mean, I don't think you can play ethereal. Uh, I think you have to trust in 
uh, to be honest, in the world that is created around you. I, I think you can spend a lot of time being anxious about, I don't know, the profundity of the being that you're playing, uh, but actually, ultimately, you have to trust that within yourself you have some qualities that can um, tell his story. I think what was actually most important for me is that Tom is a classical actor, which means that he knows how to deliver blank verse, he can go for the emotional heart while hitting the words and hitting very specific rhythms of speech and make it mean something and make it moving. Um, and Morpheus' dialogue is incredibly specific mm. and it was the thing that I was probably most obsessive about. Somebody would would have written a fabulous script, Alan Heinberg would have rewritten a fabulous script, lots of eyes would have been upon it and right at the end, and I would have seen it at every iteration, but there would always be that point right at the very, very end where I'm just noodling with the Morpheus dialogue and just making sure that the rhythms are right, making sure the words are right, getting it back to Alan. I remember you said to me that, that when he speaks and everything he says is has to feel like it's etched in stone. Yeah. That he doesn't, he's not, he's never improvising because he has experienced and perceived every thought, dream, and moment, and therefore he knows what he's gonna say. And that was a very helpful. It, 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 it is true. He, it, it, and it's the way that he was always written. He's never trying to figure out. I mean, if he is trying to figure out what he's saying while he's saying it, you know something mm. huge yeah, is going exactly. on. Exactly. Because normally, he knows exactly what he wants to say. He's picked his words, he's picked them with care. For me, uh, probably the most fun is episode five, where we get both you and death with Kirby, where, where it's just a sort of, you get to see a different side to him mm -hmm. and you get to see him slightly on the back foot the whole way. Absolutely, because only your, your older sibling can put you. Exactly. And then you get to see him with Hob Gadling every hundred years. Mm -hmm trying to figure out something and he's not even sure what he's trying to figure out mm -hmm. but he doesn't really figure that out until the very very end mm -hmm. you're gonna need all the help you can get the weirdest thing for me is when sandman was first published the first issue came out in december 1988 it was a small cult thing that felt a bit of ahead of its time. These days, it feels we didn't have to do a lot to it to quote unquote bring it up to date. It's aged incredibly well. It's aged better than it honestly had any right to do. What's changed is not Sandman. What's changed is the fact that there is now an enormous audience waiting for it and ready for it, as opposed to a cult audience, that it has to grow from a bean. I mean, Sandman starts out, nobody knew they wanted to read Sandman before Sandman came out. And then over the years, millions upon millions of copies of Sandman have been sold. A few years ago, Audible released their adaptation, sort of audio book, full cast audio book thing, and it became the fastest selling thing that Audible has ever done, out selling and in, in speed and sales, things like Harry Potter, which up until then had been the gold standard. And that was the first point, it was like, oh, well, we, we have an audience. So I think we've aged well. I think, you know, the, the, how do you bring Morpheus into current times? You literally do it, right? This, we didn't make a period piece. Oh. Like, this is set in the early 2020s. Um, and we, we took him and we put him there and we saw what happened. And that was the exciting thing about it is that if there was an organic process, it, I mean, we were, we were just talking about before, I mean, we were standing on COVID streets in London, living that um, real palpable presence. And I hope that that, and I know that that will come through. I think there is something very odd and organic that happened by being able to go, okay, this is, we're not doing it as a period piece, we're not setting it. You know, Sandman, when it came out, was being published from 88 until 1996 and is set from about 88 until, I think, 1993, technically, it all 
it's, it's a much more compressed time period. What we did here was just go, okay, he's gonna be imprisoned in 1916, just as he was, but he's gonna get out now. Let's see what happens. Yeah. And that, that's changed some things. It's changed less than you'd imagine, but it's also given us a world which again, feels very much like its own world. The only thing that we missed was I probably would have included a panel on the internet, on the serial killers convention. I, I think they should have had an internet panel because- uh, Well, they had a Zoom, a Zoom panel. Yeah, they should, have, they should have been, you know, some guys zooming in from, from Russia or whatever who couldn't actually get in to be, uh, make it across. But apart from that, I think uh, we did okay. I agree.